Hey guys, Moldy Fish Sticks here, bringing you another review on a Half-Life 2 mod. I've downloaded and been playing quite a few and been absolutely loving these games. I'm going to be doing a different style of review from here on out. I want to talk about what I love about these games, spoiler free, before I go into the story summary to leave some breathing room for people who haven't experienced these games. Obviously I'll leave timestamps in the description and spoiler warnings on screen, but the more I play these mods, the more I I realize how fucking massive and special it is to the point where I don't want to spoil the adventure for you. So for now, I'm just going to talk about the game entirely spoiler free, but trust me, I'll be sure to let you know before I get into the spoiler sections. Just like Entropy 02 and Through the City, this mod is completely free if you own the base game, which is already a great reason to simply give this game a try. Snowdrop Escape is a story-driven Half-Life 2 mod based six years after the Seven Hour War and a few years before the events of Half-Life 2. The story is set in Mother Russia, located in Northeast Europe on the Kola Peninsula, a real-life place that is one of the largest peninsulas in all of Europe. You play as James Hugo, a professional mercenary who has been hired to confront both the alien invaders and the rebels. Firstly, I want to say I think it's great to see another country's perspective in this universe, let alone a story that takes place outside of City 17 and its outskirts. However, it's more interesting that you're facing off both the Combine and the Rebels in the same game. Granted, it didn't really make much sense why there was so much violence between the Rebels and the Russians, but like, it was fun. Something that instantly gripped me to this mod was the menu, funnily enough. The menu music was a banger, and it was quite clear where this game was set from the very beginning as you see a hammer and sickle and ex-Prime Minister of the Soviet Union, Vladimir Lenin. And yes, banger music, my G. So much so that I just head bopped to it for a good few minutes. But then strange things started happening. There was a gust of wind that knocked over a coffee cup and the music halted with a series of beat boops coming from the TV. Then you turn your head to be inducted into the Illuminati and face back as if nothing happened. I don't know, I just thought this menu sequence was something very simple yet immersive. The first thing I did was load up the firing range to come to a crazy real realizations in the mechanics of this game. You can aim down sights. A lot of the weapon models and animations looked really damn good as well. Granted, some models and animations were ripped from some other games, CSGO and Left 4 Dead 2 being the main ones. However, since this is a free mod that they're not making any money from directly from downloads, I see no issue with this. You also get something ripped from Opposing Force, the wrench. I mean, yet again, I'm not gonna complain. But overall, I think this training area was a pretty good introduction to the different weapons you can equip on your adventure and a good way to introduce the ADS mechanics. Personally, I don't have a problem with aiming down sights in Half-Life games. I mean, it's more realistic, but this overall increased the vibe that I found myself feeling through this entire playthrough. This genuinely feels like a low-budget Half-Life Metro Exodus in a good way, both in its map layout and setting as a whole. Through the entirety of this game, I'm not sure how else to put it, but I, I felt like I was having a nostalgic fever dream. I'm not sure what it is about Source or Valve games, but that feeling, if you know what I'm even referring to, is definitely amplified here. It not only felt nostalgic to a weird extent, but I felt that creepy Source game feeling, especially in the early sections. Something that could give a bit more of an explanation is it feels like I'm one step away from being being jump scared or see someone watching me in the distance. This could be due to the fact that when I played Half-Life 2 for the first time and saw the G-Man in random places, I felt like I was tripping and I was getting extremely uncomfortable because I wasn't sure if I was imagining it or not. But if you like that feeling, this game is definitely one for you. Around every corner, they definitely surprise you with something and give you those shocking jump scares. Like I legitimately fucking jolted at so many points during my playthrough and it was extremely thrilling. This is something I'm so glad to see with Half-Life because they have such an untapped genre of horror that could be explored in their future games and while Alex was definitely one of the creepiest VR games in general, they could have definitely been more ballsy with their horror 
elements, I feel like it was a massive missed opportunity for an already spectacular game. But back to the weapons and gameplay, they introduced this gun called the Old Rifle, which felt like something straight out of World at War. It was this bolt action rifle that was a one hit kill on most rebels and combine and it packed such a fucking punch. There's also a sniper version of this gun, there's different variations of shotguns and assault rifles and tactical rifles. And my personal favourite was the Combine Pulse Rifle. I fucking love how you can aim down the sight of this gun now and it truly feels fitting. In no way does this feel out of place and there's just something about it. There's so many different guns that they incorporated within this game and I don't want to go into the details of all of them but just look at this wall. There's clearly a lot of stuff you can have fun with in the sandbox. There's also a PDA which acts as a notepad for the thoughts and recordings of your character to do with the events that play out. And there's an antidote mechanic for when you get poisoned by a poison zombie. Granted, this mechanic was barely used outside the early stages of this game, so it's not surprising that a lot of people found it pointless, but I thought it was a unique addition to the experience since your player doesn't have a HEV suit. This game does get a lot of flack for the crap happy voice acting and I'm not gonna lie, although Trivi and CW3D are both in it and they're fucking legends, there were some really bad attempts made from some of the other voice actors, it just sounded like they couldn't give a fuck. So if you turn away from the lackluster voice acting, I don't, I wouldn't blame you that much. But I wouldn't argue with the common belief that this mod isn't for everyone. If you're into a more story driven action packed adventure, you may not find this as enjoyable as I did. The pace is extremely slow and there's a lot of puzzles to do around every corner. This is very much a puzzle based game and although there's some great action segments and some gunplay sections where they go fucking nuts like balls to the wall round 20 in Black Ops zombie level nuts, this mod is going for a slower paced horror slash puzzle game and I fucking loved it. Puzzles in general can definitely be a drag if they're done incorrectly and just involve looking around around for random things to push and I won't lie, it was definitely present within this installment but as a whole I personally feel like the vast majority of the puzzles were so professionally made, every single one was completely different and introduced new ways of solving puzzles with physics and new mechanics all the while running off the source engine entirely. It truly caught me off guard how much they used this engine to their advantage in new and unique ways. I completely understand when YouTubers like Jarek the Gaming Dragon didn't enjoy this game like I absolutely understand. There were some sections where I just really wanted to continue with the adventure and there were some strange and confusing puzzles that proved themselves to be a huge halt to the momentum but overall I can say I enjoyed my experience and like I've said with many other mods if I bought this game for like 10 or 20 bucks I would have been very content with my purchase. The biggest compliment that I could give these Half-Life 2 mods developers is that these games feel like a pure throwaway game that Valve worked on themselves. Granted if this one had better cutscenes and voice acting, but this game was very decently sized in length and content. I genuinely didn't want it to end. Even when I was stuck on some areas, I was still totally immersed in the world that this person has built. I'm so surprised that I haven't heard of this game before, and I wouldn't have stumbled across it if it weren't for the Steam Workshop. But with all of that out of the way, here's your first First and last spoiler warning for this video, I'll be talking about the story from start to finish, a story summary, what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, and pretty much give a final conclusion on what rating I would give this mod. If you want to give this mod a try for yourself, I highly suggest you do, but with that warning out of the way, let's get into the story that is Snowdrop Escape. <laughs> First off, I loved the slow introduction to this game, both in its cutscene and the pace in general. The music is fantastic as well. You get a slow-mo zoom shot down a hallway into a control room that sets up the time and location that this story is set in. You get dropped off to get your intel from your first mission in an isolated Russian base in the middle of nowhere and the scenery here is just amazing. You really don't get great landscapes like this in a lot of mods, but you can tell a lot of effort 
effort went into making this feel like Half-Life Russian Digital Deluxe Edition. This showcases a sweet, bluey arctic landscape and I've heard people don't think the blue feel is true to life, but I've heard a lot of rebuttals to this argument by Russian themselves saying that this actually looks legit. So I did some research to see if snow could actually look blue like this in the real world and to my surprise it's a lot more common than I thought. There are two explanations that I've found that causes blue snow. One explanation is that the weather changes and the snow surface can melt overlaying ice layers compressed in the... Look, you know what? This one's pretty scientific. I don't want to bore you. But there's one scientific explanation. But the second explanation makes a little more sense given this setting. When you're comparing snow which reflects itself on a very pale white color to tight compact ice, like for instance the Antarctic landscape, the snow is simply reflecting off of the blue sky. And I mean you could find many photos of the North Pole and South Pole or other northern European landscapes where the snow or ice definitely appears to be blue, but what you're really looking at is reflection. I don't know why I felt this was important to mention, but I've seen a lot of people complain about this small detail, saying it looks like a bad, unrealistic filter, yada yada, but I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Blue snow, white snow, yellow snow, this shit was fucking beautiful. You make your way to Leonid, the head of the station. Now here's where a lot of people get confused with the story, and understandably so. Leonid gives you kind of a clusterfuck of information overload from the get-go, and I'll try and explain the confusing information. Leonid states that you've proven yourself in solo missions, and he hopes that you could do the same for him. It's funny how with all Half-Life games and mods, Half-Life 1, Half-Life 2, HP01, Opposing Force, Through the City, all of these games and mods force you to be a lone wolf, and whether these protagonists or antagonists want to endure the suffering of these missions isolated from everyone else, it becomes clear that this character does. This character, judging from the training area, he has had military grade experience and is a highly skilled professional mercenary who's able to take on the rebels and combine entirely alone and he wants to take them on alone. So like you're playing as someone who has balls of steel, my G. He also informs you that Eli Vance's army want to take over the lab complex due to their research on the parallel worlds and the people you're working for are a subgroup of Aperture Science and a newly introduced Radio Him group. It's not known how many functional branches that Aperture still has at this point in time because the one visited in Portal 1 and 2 has kind of been bamboozled by GLaDOS but this mod leans into the rivalry of not only Lambda and Aperture but Russians and Americans. It's funny how even though Earth are at war with another alien civilization there's still civil battles going on between the Slavs and the Yankees but like sadly I must admit it sounds true to how humans naturally behave. At this point the Combine have well and truly won and if this happened to Earth I'm pretty sure human to human conflict won't stop and collaborate to rebel against the alien invaders. However it's interesting that Black Mesa or Lambda represents the US and Aperture represents Russia in this universe. Granted I think more of an explanation for the reasons for the rebels extreme violence against the Russians would have been pretty helpful. It's obvious that the Russians wouldn't like Europe's leader Wallace Breen who pretty much became a sellout for humanity during the events of Half-Life 2, but the Russians should understand that the rebels are pretty much opposing the Combine and Wallace with their scientific and resistance efforts. Working together on their research of parallel worlds would have been far more productive and it's something that I believe Eli Vance would have wanted. However, this could be a Cold War situation where true intentions and motivations are lost in transit. Leonid then says something quite strange. There's no need to save humanity, it's already saved. And I'm not gonna lie, at first I was like, it's good to be optimistic, but this dude's straight up ignorant. Humanity has been absolutely gangbanged. However, while Half-Life and Portal have explored the multiversal concept in general, this particular mod takes it a step further in that there are multiple Earths within the multiverse, so not all of them have experienced the Renaissance K 
cascade, thus the Combine have not found all of them. Uh. So humanity saved. Here's where you can understand people's confusion with the plot as it's a silly idea in general and I'll give you some examples on why. If I know there's a multiverse with other Earths and I use this dude's ideology on that fact, I could go out and kill everyone and anyone I wanted and excuse myself by saying, don't worry, you're already saved. As long as I don't do it in the other Earths, you're all G, my G. Secondly, their attempt is to stop it happening again, which would be a very hard hard feat to accomplish. Are you just gonna go around to all the multiverses and enter a max security base such as Black Mesa and go, no, stop it. What if you enter Earth 4983 and Black Mesa was never invented in the first place and they all speak nado nado di and the Aztecs are the leading scientists of the world? Like, I would have wanted much more of an explanation on their actual plans with this whole operation. And why shouldn't you care about your Earth, my guy? Our Earth is is fucked. How, who, who cares about other Earths at a time like this? But Leonid straight up glossing over five major themes of the plotline in 30 seconds that drastically change and add to the Half-Life lore is not the best way to just deliver a story, but nevertheless, the anti-nihilist continues his plans and explains your duties. It's your job to head to the central laboratory and force out Vance's soldiers using poisonous gas with Liza, someone who didn't evacuate and is trapped within this complex. Once the lab is cleaned out and quiet, they'll continue with their research and voila, that's it. So after this mission brief, you're straight onto the mission and the helicopter comes to swoop you off your your princess feet and you hear a banger of a soundtrack coupled with the text snowdrop escape the helicopter drops you off and fucks right off for you to be jumped by a bunch of eshes who notice you're wearing the newest nike air maxes and you wake up to like pretty easily escape why didn't the russians give you a gun though i i don't know but this doesn't stop you from continuing on with your mission because your balls of steel are unscathed you eventually get inside the facility and end up facing zombie head crabs. Now, because you don't have a HEV suit, this game introduces a pretty genius mechanic, I won't lie, the anti-toxin injection. However, there's not many areas after the first couple missions where you're able to use this and end up carrying it around with you for no reason. But there are a few mechanics and general quirks this game introduces fairly early on that give a unique feel and a breath of fresh air to the modding scene. There are two symbols that you can follow. One that looks like a flower leading you to the lab and another that looks like this weird stick thing leading you to a supply room that also acts as a safe room and you get introduced to your PDA system which acts as internal dialogue and quest notes of the main protagonist. But overall the pace of the beginning sections of this game was pulled off perfectly. I mean you're just up against some head crabs and zombies at the start but you're initially fighting with only your fists. You end up finding a wrench that helps you out later on, smacking those little fuckers and breaking open locks, but you do not find a weapon for a fair while, for around half an hour, which is a pretty big chunk of the playtime. I mean, I still do wonder why they didn't give you a gun. Some people didn't like this approach, but honestly, I did not mind. It gave you an extra sense of vulnerability and weariness around every corner, and trust me, around every corner, there was shit going down. This section is definitely not a walk in the park. You later get introduced to a Doom-like color coordinated key mechanic sitting right next to a gun. There are a lot of great puzzles here that I like, but one of the more satisfying ones appears shortly after this section where there's dials you have to turn while they're actively rotating and shut down the power when it all lands on the right numbers. Don't know if I explained it well, and I'm not gonna lie, this confused the fuck out of me first glance, but they really attempt attempted to make every single puzzle all unique and distinctive and there's multiple ways to do them as well. Take this section for example. I propped up a sphere and whacked it into the door to bust it open but I've seen YouTubers such as Rocky Rockhead actually do a puzzle that I did not even do at all and to be fair I probably wouldn't have figured this out. As you move through the rest of this mission and reach its end you eventually come to a fucking spectacular scene. I don't know what it is about this claustrophobic outdoor snowy design but it seemed like such a nostalgic 
fever dream of a cut map from Half-Life 2. I really don't know how else to word it. Maybe this was due to the fact that I played this sleep deprived, but I love this. The way you have to climb up and fight off parkouring fast zombies is done perfectly. Enter chapter 2. This is where the game kind of puts their hand on your shoulder and softly whispers. So you think there's not enough action? Not enough zombies to shoot? Silly man. Not gonna lie, this was one of many survival segments I fucking loved about this game. It was not only a great break from the slow paced sections previously explored, but this was damn wild. I loved it. But in saying that, after this section I was stuck. Like, stuck stuck. This was one of the hardest sections to figure out where to go and not gonna lie, I straight up stopped playing for the day because I was walking around in circles and had to come back later to wrap my head around it. Pretty much you have to turn on all these valves to turn off the steam and make your way through this area and eventually you find a room where you're able to use a key to get the old rifle. And fucking great rifle I have to say. But this room in particular completely bamboozled me. I wasn't sure if I had to do something with the stove or break the wooden planks that were nailed to this window, but it really doesn't make much sense that you couldn't break it. You eventually find out that you need to interact with a loose tile on the floorboard to continue your adventure to the lab, and I was like, really man? But oh well, chop chop, we have work to do. And the next map layouts really showcase the talent that was behind this game. These small tunnels leading to an underground metro system really capture such a creepy feeling that reminded me a lot of a metro game, coupled with dead silence only to be greeted by a drip that had an eerie echo to it. The design and soundscape complemented each other so damn well, and if you're looking for a slow paced horror survival type Half-Life mod, by this point it would have completely sold you. Hey asshole, do you know what had to grab tentacles when balls got in common? I thought you had all been devoured by grass. They fit right into your fucking mouth. You clear out this section and attempt to operate a crane, although I didn't know what the fuck I was attempting to do until like three tries in. So apparently, using this slow ass crane to slowly transport poisonous gas across the whole warehouse area to get blown through into a room where this dumb fuck lambda dude just stands there watching Watching you do this whole thing slowly but surely just to stand there and die a horrible death because he's locked in a room where he can't open the door to leave. Anyway, after killing this guy, you head across the room to open the unlocked door to leave and make your way to a section where you need to use weights to open the door and again, fun puzzle. After you engage in more bloody conflict and come to an elevator, you find epic zombie survival segment number two. The first one was great. Right, but this one amps up everything by about tenfold. They aren't your usual slow zombies from before, you're getting rushed by fast zombies. The music and lighting in this section just add such a fucking cool vibe to the whole thing. And there's health randomly scattered around the lower levels, but if you're careless you could easily use it all up. I feel that this provides such an awesome fast paced challenge, all the while being very balancing and rewarding. But anyway, you escape world War Z and end up in more metro tunnels, but this time occupied by rebels and cluttered with proximity mines. And after this section, you probably face one of the hardest bosses in any Half-Life game or mod to date. I'm not even twisting your nipple here. This boss shouldn't even be a boss. It doesn't even look like a boss. But just like your preschool librarian said, don't judge a Lambda soldier by their armor. This fuckhead is the biggest bullet sponge I have ever come across. The way he just staunches you is absolutely unmatched by even your Yaya holding flip-flops over her head herself. This motherfucker must be on bath salt to withstand clips upon clips from submachine guns and shotguns after walking through grenades unscathed. I have no idea how I was able to kill this thing, but damn am I glad that it was over when it was. And not only about five minutes later, you are graciously greeted with yet again another masterfully designed cutscene with Oscar-worthy voice acting. Acting. had already found and entire the core that the went. Please make part two and don't change anything, not one fucking thing. This is... F <laughs>
<laughs> this is incredible. Further on, you'll find their objectives written on a whiteboard, and you'll see that they're at stage 6 out of 8 with their infiltration of the lab core. However, they haven't managed to actually do this as of yet, but after they do, they want to bring the scientists working with Radio Him and Aperture to study the lab equipment for the Lambda Fighters, and that'll be the end of their capture operation. Progressing forward, a Vortigaunt can be seen in this area, however it doesn't attack you directly, it only attempts to delay your efforts, which I feel is a good thing. I mean, I don't mind fighting Rebels and Combine in the same game, I think it's pretty cool that you're playing as a third party, however I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to fight Vortigons, they're cool dudes, but for them to just make an appearance in general is pretty neat. The following area has a lot of cool things that I think they did pretty well. The Portal 1 music radio was definitely one of them. I carried this thing around for a little bit, it was such a fucking tune. There was also some dude taking a dump in the toilet who has no idea that you're the enemy and you can later decide if you want to kill him or not because he's unarmed. But I personally like this map design a lot. I know I go on and on about map designs but this was just so well made. And when you reach this box treadmill thing my mind exploded. Something I love about the Valve developers when they make games, especially with Half-Life 2 and the Paul series, is they experiment with physics in the game and make it fun for the player. This was no exception. Now here's the biggest aspect of this game the temple, and a sort of meaning behind the spheres found throughout the game. You come across a giant sphere with other areas you can place the spheres in around it. You find out this temple was found in the 18th century by a religious cult who observed this anomaly they called the Divine Miracle. They admit the orb's origins are unknown, however if you're around the area of the center of this anomaly, an observer's memory and consciousness will shift between their minds and the mind of an observer from a parallel world and when you later place all the small orbs in order around the big orb you get sent to another universe where to your shock you have visited many times before and it seems like you're the only one visiting this world you eventually find your way out and leave this place and this isn't really explored again although it was quite trippy and I'm glad this mod had a unique spin on the half-life floor I feel like like I've said it with other mods I've reviewed before, but words can't really describe how happy I am with the entire Half-Life modding scene, bringing so much content that Valve has failed to deliver us, and honestly, like I said, it makes me content with the idea that Valve may never make Half-Life 3. Although, it would be nice. It would be very nice. But anyway, moving swiftly forward, you find Lisa, the damsel in distress who will help you gas the fuck out of this facility. Somehow they just let Lisa carry around a blue keycard she hands over to you to find a yellow keycard to let her out. Don't know why they let her keep this, but you know, we will question this once the mission is over. Not gonna lie, this is where the puzzles can be a bit of a drag for most people, and personally, wasn't a massive fan either. I was stuck on this for so long that I needed to use a guide to help me with this section and I'm so glad I did because I never would have figured this out on my own. However, past this section you come across a startling realization about multi-universal travel or the lack of it. You find out that science revolving around the parallel worlds evolved rapidly from 1980 to 1985. However, the core you previously visited turned out to be a window instead of a door and it was in possible to enter another universe. Look, this is honestly where James should have turned around and headed back to inform Leonid this mission was all for nothing. There was nothing their team could do that could prevent the Renaissance Cascade from occurring on other planets. You could only observe it, you can't stop it. But perhaps Hugo is still insistent on completing his mission, or at least saving Lisa from her imprisonment. So on would you go, and the next section is definitely a big highlight of this game. You come across a radio with a mysterious voice talking to you directly, who was a member of Radio Him. He informs you that there's a cloud of sentient lightning that you need to be weary of, and during this section you must run and hide from it before it notices you and strikes. There's also a baby bull squid that you can feed. 
10 out of 10. This whole section was a blast and I particularly loved how you needed to use your flare to light up the projectors to scare it off. I don't know, don't ask questions, this was cool. After lighting up enough of the projectors, you make your way to Walmart Borealis to come face to face with your first adult sized bull squids who were quite challenging and to be fair, I wish there was more areas that the bull squids were in this game. Nevertheless, you finally find the mysterious radio him dude who kills a rebel soldier and talks to you face to face or mask to face. Not gonna lie, this voice actor ain't half bad, but he looks like he's cosplaying for the next annual purge. He pretty much reaffirms what you read, this place can't be used as a corridor between worlds. And if it could be, the other worlds probably wouldn't be too thrilled talking with a world who's infested with the Combine. But at the end of this dialogue, he finally gives you the long awaited yellow key card and why why didn't he just use it to free Lisa? The reason for this choice is that he wanted you to use his hot new hot car, his hot car. And Lisa can go and go fuck herself because this car has new rims. So after this vehicle segment, you soldier down to Lisa and she takes absolutely no time at all to start filling up the facility with gas. You put on your gas mask and escape to the surface where you're greeted by the most majestic music in this game that complements the feeling of freedom so well. I need to take this moment to talk about a very strong feeling of deja vu I experienced in this particular section. Although I am extremely disappointed with Valve's lack of contribution to Half-Life and Portal series over like the past decade, it doesn't excuse how much of a masterpiece Half-Life Alex was and one of the best parts about Alex was how they slowly introduced the Combine and I feel this game does this on a very very similar level. The way that you hear their radio chatter before encountering them is done so well. It honestly reminded me of Half-Life Alex. but I fucking love how this whole segment is presented. You're finally back out into the surface after seeing daylight again but you're given the harsh reminder that this doesn't mean it's a good thing with the Combine out on their patrol. So you're out left to roam an abandoned apartment complex that was once brimming with life. Here you'll find a lot of English and Russian letters and notes left behind during their final moments of survival against the Combine. There's a lot of optional areas where you can explore here and find a room of someone who took their own life because I presume they didn't want someone else to take it from them either in death or being forced to join the Combine. I won't show the scene here as it's maybe a bit too full on for YouTube but there's a lot of attention to detail in this small area and you find Finally get your hands on a rocket launcher that you can use to blow up a combine armored vehicle which is always a good time. Further along you'll come across a TV broadcast that brings a lot of sense into the current situation. Due to the recent upsurge of terrorist attacks attributed to Eli Vance's team, there have been tightened security measures within the surrounding cities. There's a daily surveillance of all citizens with restrictions of movement within the city, alongside a ban of any unauthorized distribution of foods. Failing to abide by these strict quarantine rules will result in arrest or to put it bluntly, most likely death. Later on you find a companion that will help you through this adventure. A hacking tool to help you search the lab. The bloodshed of the Combine from your hands doesn't go unnoticed, however now the Combine are hellbent on capturing you, which attracts the unwanted attention of a damn Combine airship to try and take you out. You find fuel for a water slash land vehicle that you use to drive through the sewers in an attempt to escape and this wild goose chase goes on for quite some time. Now here's where I definitely feel that the puzzles were a huge halt to the momentum of this action packed sequence. Like you're in a high speed chase and you, you need to stop every second to find something to do and it was like man, really man? of all times now, but you eventually make your way to an area where the Combine pretty much asks you to surrender by placing a Combine human transport unit in your path and attempt to entice you by getting an apartment with food and medicine. But what's interesting and I feel a little limiting given the ending, you cannot in any way choose to give up here and now and join the Combine. I feel like the multiple choice given that there's already somewhat of multiple 
endings within this game would have been nice to explore, but nevertheless you refuse and don't want to be tempted into the dark side of the force. Eventually you find yourself in a town where you've had enough of this bullshit airship chasing you for close to an hour and you damage it enough for it to fuck off back to the combine overworld. This area is quite fun to explore, a cool thing they added here is a radio hymn message which has been left by Leonid himself, pretty much showing that he's well aware of the Combine's chase after James Hugo, and simply orders everyone to get out of this town unless your goal is to defend and protect Hugo. So given this message, safe to say everyone bitched it. But that's okay, you have balls of steel my brochure show, you don't need help. All you need is a wrench and a brand new ADS mechanic. Now here's where some people kind of got sick of the puzzles and while I admit the revolving number sequence code puzzle is very overused by this point, the physics puzzles never fail to surprise me. There's quite literally a brand new puzzle around every corner that forces you to think of the logistics, although at times quite random and inconceivable, there's no argument that these puzzles are extremely inventive. This time, you use explosion, but in a different way. You have to like overload this thing and then blow up a door. It's pretty cool. But puzzles aside, the Combine airship is pissed for bitching it and grows some hair on its metallic chest to come back for round 22 to fuck shit up. But little does it know, you have a Gatling gun to fuck their shit up. You destroy the airship once and for all and this does give you a sense of fuck yeah, even more so than the helicopter in Half-Life 2 because this crazy bitch was chasing you for damn near an hour and a half at this point. I feel like I left out a lot of the chase segments in general because there wasn't much to talk about besides the scenery and puzzles and as far as I know not a lot of story plot was unfolding during most of this section because you were simply running and surviving. But that doesn't take away the fact that this whole section was definitely fun, and the car mechanics were a whole lot better than Half-Life 2's at being completely fucking helpless. Not gonna lie, it was fun, but damn annoying. You really had to make sure you were driving around the smallest bush or bump, or your vehicle does a fucking 1080 backside tail slide hard flip, kick flip, laser flip. Man, Tony Hawk would be jealous of the amount of stunts I managed to land on this janky piece of shit. But nevertheless, someone calls for his mummy, you totally don't shoot him, and you leave this hellhole behind, only to inevitably be captured by the Combine. One of their leaders somewhat admires your efforts, stating that barely any Combine would be able to accomplish what you have achieved, and pretty much conveys that you have no choice but to join them now. Here's where the voice acting took a huge leap in my opinion, and this was because this Combine is actually CW3D, the same voice actor who voiced Wilson in Entropy 02. And the end. But wait, there's more. After the credits finish rolling, you awaken in the cell where they're holding you and now your duty is to escape. You make your way past the sleeping guard and turn off the power to later be greeted by a helping hand who advises that you should probably take off your prisoner uniform and put on ordinary civilian clothing so they don't arrest you. This whole stealth mission was fucking immaculate, my guy. I've always said that Half-Life needs more stealth missions done right and this final segment is is something that was a ripe cherry on top of the game for me. Although this bitch... Hey, how did you get here? Hey, how did you get Security. here? Security! An intruder! Can go fuck herself with a chainsaw. Alas, you get your clothing and venture through a magnificently designed combine station where you come across a very familiar voice. A very familiar voice indeed. Did these guys get voice acting lessons? Nah. It's just Trivi. Trivi's the bad cop in Entropy 02. If, I mean, you should know that. Now, this is the standard ending that you'll get. The combine cop will ask for you to have your papers ready by the time he's back from Smoko. And during this time, you'll attempt to bust out, only to be stopped by a Combine Commander. He admits you're smart and crafty, yet your rebellious antics have left you untrusted. So he's going to tear your humanity away from you, and turn you into an Overwatch soldier. The end. 
However, in order to get the good ending, you need to remember a code which simply reads remember this code found in the other dimension back at the temple, which you will use in the final section of this game to unlock a door and steal civilian clothing. The Combine won't notice you and you make your daring escape. And with that, the story comes to a close, but there are a few other things that people may not have noticed upon their first playthrough. Something I found pretty cool is that another version of yourself from another universe helped you out. This is obvious because James Hugo is the only person who visited the particular universe you travel to. Some people believe the reoccurring number 163020 is the number of the universe, and it makes sense that this could definitely be, because when you go to the other universe, it's clear that they know their number of the universe, and there's some workings out on the wall that provide a possible theory on the number of the universe, although they might not actually know because, uh, I don't know, maybe we're the dumb universe who got invaded by the Combine. It's already apparent that this mission was not a success. In fact, it was a complete and utter clusterfuck. Multi-dimensional travel was, at this time, not possible. But also, the capture of James Hugo by the Combine put an end to Aperture and Radio Him's employment of him, dramatically halting their endeavours. However, there was a pretty big event that happens in the epilogue. Within James Hugo's wanted post, it's revealed that the Combine found the lab's bunker and forced Radio Him to detonate charges and destroy the place. Even after James and Lisa managed to gas the entire facility, the Combine found it first. This entire mission was a complete clusterfuck. I do think that the standard ending should have had a better outcome given the extensive stealth section you underwent. I admit it did feel a bit anticlimactic. Also, it's apparent in Hugo's notes that some members of Lambda Resistance were once a part of the Russian Mafia and could be a sort of explanation of their hostility. However, I feel that there's more that needs to be developed and explained here and it's explained at moments through the story that the Resistance want to use the anomaly as an extra dimensional shortcut to contact other worlds for help against the Combine, completely unaware that the anomaly doesn't work like that. This highlights a certain aspect of the game that is somewhat problematic. The whole theory of the multiverse and how its rules apply are completely different in this game as opposed to Half-Life or Portal's take. The anomaly is not only mystical in nature compared to the man-made portal in Half-Life 1, but things can actually travel from and to other dimensions in general in Half-Life 1, an opposing force. Maybe this just has to do with the anomaly itself and doesn't apply to how multiversal travel works when using other methods, but in knowing that, why wouldn't the Russians and Resistance want to seek out Black Mesa's research instead of this random fucking thing? But yeah, more development needs to be done here. I still think that it was a cool idea. Flaws of this game aside, with its at times confusing and rushed story story and script coupled with questionable voice acting, it definitely provided such a fun and unique spin on a Half-Life story that played out like a horror slash stealth slash puzzle game, which still to its core felt entirely like a Half-Life game. Honestly, my biggest constructive criticism I could give this, and this probably will be a hot take, but I don't care, hire Russian voice actors to actually voice act in Russian. I would really dig that shit. I mean, call me a weeb if you want, but when I watch Hunter x Hunter, hey, 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 shut up, shut the fuck up and just listen, all right? When I listen to it dubbed, it probably drops my original rating of 12 out of 10 to around a seven. I just can't stand the English takes on a lot of other nations' works of art. The Spanish film, The Platform, is a fucking prime example of this. The English voice actors made me want every everyone to jump off that fucking platform. It would have been so cool to just have entirely Russian dialogue for all of the Russians in this game. I really don't mind reading subtitles, but I feel like it would be more immersive in my opinion. Aside from that, I have no idea how such a small team could have managed to create this. Although the slow pace isn't for everyone, I had a blast and I'm so fucking excited for the next project, which is going to release in under a year if all goes well. But if you need more 
time, take your time. This isn't a triple leg game you're developing and everyone would appreciate a final product that the team and everyone else was happy with themselves. If anyone wants to know what the next game these guys are making, it'll be called Swelter. And there's a trailer that's already out as well as a wishlist option on Steam and simply wishlisting indie games like these help the developer a lot more than you realize. But I'll be linking their mod DB down below for anyone who's interested in following and supporting this mod while it updates. In conclusion, I'd probably give this mod a 7 out of 10. I really enjoyed it heaps and I'm so excited for what they have in plan for the future. That'll be it for this video guys. Feel free to like and subscribe as I have a lot more mods I need to play. But the next video will probably be a take on Half-Life 2's VR mod as that released recently and I haven't even played it yet. But feel free to comment down below if I left something out or if you have any suggestions for other mods or games in general you want me to cover. I'd actually highly highly appreciate it but thanks for watching and as always stay safe, stay sexy, stay humble, mwah, mwah, mwah. suck your nipple.